Here we go. I'm Dave Johnson, and welcome to another edition of the DC Sports Huddle, along with George Wallace, Rob Woodford, Chris Chion. Now, we probably didn't need a scorecard, but believe me, if you're going to hang in DC Sports, as we know, last week, I think we were about the only four players or four persons that were not traded as a, an interesting week, to say the least, in DC Sports. But before we go with the Nationals and the Wizards, uh, we begin with the Washington football team, because uh, while certainly it's different when we're talking about the trading of players and the look of the Wizards and the Nationals, it is very much still the same, the push to get vaccinated for this Washington football team. And, and George, I don't know if we thought this would be a story this year. We thought there'd be so much <clears throat> clamor to, to go ahead and get vaccinated, given what, everything we went through last year. And it's still a story right now in the NFL and specifically the Washington football team. Yeah, you know, and it's it's disappointing. And Ron Rivera is very frustrated about it. And he should be. Uh, I mean, you know, to have one of the least vaccinated teams in the league and to keep saying, you know, you need more information. I mean, Rivera's done everything possible, brought in multiple experts to talk to these guys about vaccines. He beat cancer, for goodness sakes, last year. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, and look, it's at some point, it's going to cost this team. Already seven guys on the list right now, including – three of uh, possible four starters, uh, Brandon Sheriff being one of them. Uh, so, it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's disappointing that we are at this point. They should not be having to answer questions about vaccines at this point in training camp when they're trying to defend an NFC East title and get back to uh, normal as far as training camp is concerned. You have a new quarterback, you have new additions on this team, and every day we're still talking about vaccines. Now, he did say last week in Richmond, that a number of guys came to him and want to get the shot after seeing what the protocols are going to be because the NFL is going to make it hard on you if you don't get the shot. Uh, and then he said that they wanted a number, a number of guys wanted to get the shot Sunday when they returned home. So they set up a whole vaccination appointment event for guys to go and get vaccinated. But the problem is you have some of these leaders out there saying that it's a personal decision. Nobody can make me do it. And we need more information about it. It's not going to divide the locker room and things in that, but, I don't buy that. I'm sorry. If it gets to a point this season where you're going to have to forfeit a game and miss a paycheck and you're going to cost your team, at some point it's going to, I think, divide the locker room. As Terry McLaurin said it, you don't want to be the guy to not to, to not be vaccinated and cause this team to miss games and forfeit. So, unfortunately, we're still talking about it. He says they're trending in the right direction. Let's hope that's the case after his last couple of days of vaccine. So, we'll see what happens. Yeah, that's the nature of being on a team. You don't want to let your teammates down. You don't right. want to uh, throw an interception. So you certainly don't want to do something that you very much have control over. And the thing that I can't wrap my head around is as, as a, a living, these are players that put things in their body so they yeah. can perform on a regular basis. That's basically all this is. If yep. you want to perform in the NFL right now, uh, effectively without fear of a delay or interruption, you need to get vaccinated, Rob. Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, this is better than painkillers. And if you have no problem taking painkillers or Toradol shots, then you shouldn't have a problem with taking a vaccine. Um, I, I feel like when we were talking about Washington last week, this was, uh, you know, I brought up how they don't put together consecutive good seasons. And there's always something you don't see on paper. They look good on paper, but then they don't translate it onto the field. Well, this feels like that thing that's going to uh, that's going to screw up the 2021 season for them because you know we a lot of times we discount uh, you know this as practice you know oh we're talking about practice when we're talking about uh, uh, training camp but training camp is where you lay the foundation for your team for any football team let alone this one where you have a new quarterback you have some new guys on the skill positions and all of those guys look good on paper but they have to get on the same page and if Guys, I mean, of the seven guys who are sidelined uh, by the COVID protocols, at least three of them are guys that are projected starters. So if you're having to go an extended period of time without guys uh, and, and for no particularly good reason in the grand scheme of things, then this is just not uh, th this is the kind of thing that can that can screw up their season before it even begins. Chris. Um. As far as vaccinations goes, I don't feel that I am in a position to tell people one way or another what they should do with them. I'm vaccinated personally. I believe that everybody should be, but there are probably reasons some of these guys are wary of it. And I think that in the locker room, I don't know that that's so much going to divide the guys or be so much of a distraction. I'm sure they don't want to answer the questions, but Otherwise, they might be getting the same ones 
every single day, like who's going to be the starting quarterback, Taylor Heineke or Ryan Fitzpatrick. I mean, I heard George say there's a new quarterback. Well, I don't keep, I wouldn't keep discounting Taylor Heineke. Let's just say that maybe this is a coaching staff that wants to see him succeed, played really well in that playoff game, but yeah, this is being talked about. I think that it'll hopefully all get sorted out here. It's really just the league in itself. I mean, you know, you hope that we don't go down a road where there's a number of teams getting these COVID issues. I mean, it's happening in Major League Baseball. The top pitcher, maybe AL Cy Young Award winner, Garrett Cole, it just testing positive. So uh, it, it can be a scary time. I'll leave it at this because I got to head to a meeting. Um, Dave, as the voice of the Wizards, I can't wait to listen back and hear your thoughts on this trade of Russell Westbrook, just because I don't really know what this franchise is trying to accomplish, but I think you probably have a better vision than I do. So sayonara, my friends, uh, have a great rest of the show. All right. Chris is uh, bringing international languages into the DC sports auto, which is good as he says sayonara. Uh, and that'll probably start speculation that Rui Hachimura was, was uh, traded and that's not the, the case. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> no, no. What, what? Uh, in short, I'll we'll get off topic here with with the Wizards situation. Uh, there was only going to be a certain number of teams, <laughs> maybe one. The Lakers. <laughs> the, the list is not very long. That you can make a deal involving Russell Westbrook and get something uh, in return. They appreciated the Wizards what Russell Westbrook brought to the team, but when you look at the big picture in a, in a span of a year, General Manager Tommy Shepard was able to get rid of the, the handcuffing of the John Wall contract, get Russell Westbrook, a player who, by the way, helped you get to the playoffs, helped change the culture in the locker room, and oh, by the way, then get a lot of value in return before his contract expired, which that could have been the way it ended in Washington, where, yes, it was great to have Russell Westbrook, and he moves on and leaves, and the team has nothing. Instead, right now what the team has is players – and options. So you're thinking, all right, well, uh, Thomas Bryant, now can we trade him because Montrez Harrell? I'm not saying we should. I'm just, I'm just throwing this out off the top of my head. And all of a sudden, you have what every team wants, players and options and ability to do things. And, and again, accountants are far smarter than I am at this, but it's opening up things um, in the short term for the Wizards on the, on the balance sheet, which you have to compete on as well. Uh, in the NBA. So uh, I think it was, it was, it was a move that, you know, you can look at how it was graded. More people are wondering what the Lakers were doing, quite frankly, uh, than the Wizards. So this is one where it looks like the Wizards uh, are getting the better of the deal. In fairness, uh, the Lakers are, are a good franchise with a good team. You get a Russell Westbrook in there, and maybe that is the one veteran piece that, that puts you back uh, in, in a title situation. But for the Wizards, it really helps them going forward for the future. Well, I mean, I mean it, yeah, it kind of seems like that's a mutually beneficial situation because the Lakers are in a position to compete for a championship now. The Wizards are trying to build in that direction. So if even one or two of the pieces that they got back in the Westbrook deal ends up being uh, uh, one of the cornerstones or one of the key players for a team that becomes a playoff contender again, then it's worth the while. Would they uh... – Dave, I was thinking, you know, it's the question I think a lot of people have, would this have been different if Scott Brooks had remained the head coach? Because he kept talking about how much he loved playing for Scott and what he meant to him and this and that. So maybe is that a conversation that was had? You know, who knows if uh, Westbrook goes to Tommy Shepard and says, look, if Scott's not back, let's, you know, let's, let's move on. I'm sure that there were conversations, right, to be had, Dave, behind the scenes as far as Russell. I mean, I know there's no secret you wanted to get back home to L.A. It's been, this has kind of been in the works. I get that. And maybe was this was the Scott Brooks thing, I guess, the last shoe to drop, you think? Yeah, no, I, I think really uh, Tommy Shepard said it best that you have to be ready when an opportunity presents itself. And I think something like this, I'm not saying it happened in a matter of hours, but yeah. I think it quickly developed uh, in terms of the Lakers' desire for Russell Russell Westbrook. So, I think this is not a sentimental league uh, that, that Scott Brooks probably knew if he was staying around, maybe Russell Westbrook wouldn't be, or, or vice, well, and obviously vice versa, as Scott Brooks was, was uh, not welcomed back and, and uh, Russell Westbrook was facing the prospect of going on without him as the head coach. It, it very much 
uh, is a business. And, and especially when you get to that level and that level uh, of contract, you're, you're just not going to be able to make a deal for Russell Westbrook with everyone. And this was a, a special circumstance that I think, and I think Rob, you said it best, you know, benefited both teams. While some would argue the Wizards got the, the better of the deal, the, the bottom line is the Lakers, it probably really puts them in a position to continue with their goal to, to win a, a championship. So now it lets the Wizards be part of the uh, fun, silly season, the NBA free agent, at least on, on a minor level, so to speak. Uh, but, you know, that's now point guard is the, the need that is most pressing. And the name we keep hearing is Spencer Dinwiddie from the, the Brooklyn Nets. All right, I think I would say real quick, I, you got to give Tommy Shepard credit too. We talked about last year. The only team that only person in the entire league that he could have traded for John Wall is Russell Westbrook right. because of that contract. Right. Mm -hmm. So right. I give him a ton of credit for that. And then this year too. So let's give Tommy Shepard some credit. That's well, it. his, his, his draft uh, the acquisition of Daniel Gafford. Uh, and we're excited to see what that's going to bring. Uh, Corey yep. Kispert uh, by all accounts is somebody that is going to be able to make the transition uh, to the NBA, he's a shooter, and that's a skill you can't have enough of in the NBA. And it's a shout out also to the Gonzaga program. They produce players uh, yeah. that translate well to the NBA, in my opinion. All right, we cover the Washington football team, the Nationals. Uh, we, we on the JoJo Gray train already, based on, <laughs> on Monday night. But speaking of general managers, that you know, you've got to look long term, and I, I think. Didn't think that maybe they could re-sign Trey Turner and it was time to move Max Scherzer. And now they have some options, George. Yeah, I, I have no problem with what they did. I think the fans' biggest issue is the Trey Turner thing because that is telling you that the learners are saying two years out, we're not going to pay this guy. Or we're not going to be in the, in the Turner sweepstakes. And you go back and they think about the Bryce Harper thing, Anthony Rendon. So I think that is the only thing that, that the fans – are upset about. Look, I, you got to give Rizzo credit too. I mean, you're dumping all these contracts. All these guys are going to walk next year and you weren't going to get anything for them. So I have no problem with it, especially the haul you get for Max and Trey. Now look, Max would be a candidate to come back. He loves it here. He still can pitch. You know, I mean, it's made no secret. You heard Davey say all the time how many conversations he and Max have had and Rizzo have had, uh, you know, about the future and, and what's best for this team and best for Max Scherzer and his family. So that could be a situation to come back. I, I, they had to do something because you could continue treading water and yeah, the division's not that good, but you weren't really showing signs of getting over the hump. Steven Strasburg's not coming back this year. Who knows if he's going to pitch again? Uh, you know, Joe Ross has been in and out. Patrick Corbin, John Lester, not really performing. So, you know, it's a situation, it sucks because I mean, that just wasn't like a, a slight tweak. This was an implosion. I mean, for what they did to this team. So you don't want to see it because fans are going to pay this big money to go out and watch this team, which they don't want it right now. But you had to do it. But I think the biggest thing is the Trey Turner thing because that is signaling again from ownership that we're not going to spend. You have to sign Juan Soto. I don't care what you do. You hand him a check. If he wants anything to be, to be here at all, you have to sign him because at some point you're going to have to do it. Okay, Steven Strasburg won in 11 years, whatever that is. So – at some point, you got to sign somebody. Well, and I think you make a great point. And I think part of the belief was they couldn't keep them all. And, and it's a gamble. It's a roll of the dice, and you've got to make the decision now when you can make a trade versus when, it, when it's too late, when they're just – and, and it's, it is a gamble. And, look, they wanted to keep Bryce Harper. It didn't work out. Rob? Yeah, and, uh, I mean, George, <laughs> George uh, hit on the point that I was going to hit on, and that is that the trading Trey Turner sig totally says – because we were talking about them trading Scherzer. That just made all the sense yeah. in the world because he's a big ticket item. You could get the most return on that. But by trading Trey Turner, that announces basically we are rebuilding. And so that to me is huge because, I mean, over the course, I mean, I don't know that we've ever seen uh, Washington have a fire sale before the trade deadline like this. So, um, you know, just the everything must go attitude. It, it, they are rebuilding. And so um, I, I was very heartened by what I saw from um, from uh, from from Gray last night uh, or Monday night. <laughs> you know, I, I thought he played well. I thought he was poised. And, uh, and if he's going to be uh, sort of the face of that rotation moving forward, I would be comfortable with that. And of course, there's there's the symmetry. And I know that this is parenthetical, but you have uh, you have one of the few black 
starting pitchers in the league, last name Gray, playing in the city of the Grays. Hey, man, I, I, I love it. I'm here for it. I think he's going to be a really popular player and a very, um, a very productive player for the Nats. And, and hey, not that's, make... that's way too deep right now, man. How you get that? Oh, no. That's way too deep at this time well, of day. No, first of all, that's a great history reference, <laughs> and I in no way making light of it, but but great use of the word parenthetically. I was waiting yeah. for that all show. Yeah. I like symmetry, to bring out the vocab words every once in a while. Parenthet- symmetry hey. and parenthetically. I mean, that's, that's two school words. Hey, well, man, it's, 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 how about uh, right no pressure on uh, JoJo Gray? Davey Martinez yeah. says he's our future. He's the future, yeah. right. Yeah, welcome, yeah. welcome to D.C., Hey, as, as, a, as a former quarterback in this town once said, no pressure, no diamonds, baby. No right. pressure, no diamonds. <laughs> no, you're up against clock. George, final thought. Any any practice catch excite you the most so far at training camp or anything else come uh, out at you? Yeah, you know, you know, it's a couple of things to watch. Like it's been a lot of fun to watch Terry McLaurin and William Jackson the third, the new corner. Uh go, ones going up against each other has been a lot of fun. I think you're gonna like Jared Patterson, the running back. He's been fun to watch. Uh, and Adam Humphreys and Ryan Fitzpatrick already have that combo from Tampa Bay. He's kind of, he's going to be his guy. And on the defense, I mean, it's, it's just been between young uh, chase young and Montez sweat from for first snap of the first practice last week. And they're in the backfield. I mean, they are just flying all over the place. And I know we've said it last year about how good this defensive line can be, but I mean, sky's the limit right now for these guys. They're just, a, they're in their second year together and they know, and all, and all of them to a man have said, you can't count on anything from last year. You're starting over. You accomplished absolutely nothing. So if they go in with that mental mentality, it could be scary. Bob, final thought? I uh, just want to give it up to Simone Biles for uh, coming back and competing. Uh, not, not just coming back and competing, but actually getting a medal. And there are some people who are going to be wrongheadedly disappointed that she got bronze instead of gold. And look, uh, over the course of the last year and a half, I think it's important for people to know that it's okay to not be okay. And I think that she went from being the face of USA Gymnastics to the face of, you know, advocating for mental health. And so I'm, as somebody who has struggled over the last year and a half, that is an important thing for her to bring to the forefront. And I hope that people start to, instead of looking at her as selfish or, you know, what any of these ridiculous things that I've heard, uh, over the course of the past week, I hope that people look at that and uh, and really start to take mental health as seriously as they do physical health. Nobody's going to go yell at uh, Carson Wentz because his his uh, surgically repaired foot isn't ready in two or three days for them to be ready for the season. We can't do that for athletes who are who are now more than ever being able to step up and say, "I'm struggling. I need to take a beat." I need to get right so that I can compete at the highest level. And the reality is that uh, all of us at, at one time, people watching this, listening to this uh, struggle with mental health. And we struggle in part with it because uh, we work so hard to suppress it. We use so much energy uh, because we don't have a, a physical ailment to, to go, you know, elicit sympathy. Instead, we're trying to uh, suppress it and, and, and that doesn't do uh, anybody any good and, and Simone Biles had the courage to do it on the on arguably the and, biggest stage and also it's watch. internal there's no cast for this right. you know right. you can't put know. on there's no prosthesis that announces that we're struggling mentally so because oftentimes people can't see the struggle um, I, I think the old saying is like basically you're you know all of your struggles but everybody you're seeing everybody else's highlights and you know all of your struggles so People don't see the struggle, so then they don't believe that it's there or they, you know, just, you know, whatever. But you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. And I think Simone uh, said that on the podium, actually. (laughs) You know, we're people. We're not just avatars out here performing. So And and, uh, as as I've been careful never to say settle for a silver or settle. It's not if you're you're there, congratulations to you. If you're uh, on the team at all and Mm -hmm. made it that far, that's that's just that's just amazing. On a lighter note, or I'll just end with maybe a topic for a future uh, DC sports huddle. Kind of lost in the in the shuffle of, of the, the chaos of last week. Uh, Alex Ovechkin re-upping his his contract, staying with the Washington Capitals. Now that's not a shock, but as somebody pointed out, it really does start to fuel the debate: Will he retire as the greatest athlete in DC sports history? Uh, growing up in this area, if you told me one day a hockey player would be <laughs> held in that esteem. I wouldn't think would be possible. And certainly I think you can now make an argument, 
even now, and now as Ovechkin's career is going to continue here, that we are witnessing the greatest athlete in D.C. sports history. That'll be for another time. We're out of time. We're almost out of panelists on this show, so we better end it this week. <laughs> Rob Woodfork, Chris Chion, and uh, George Wallace. I'm, I think I'm Dave Johnson. That's your D.C. Sports Huddle. Break. <laughs>